I don't know. I thought I saw somebody pass stuff from heat exhaustion or something. Okay, so I, I wanna I wanna start this actually um, just you know by manner of greets I guess um, I want to congratulate uh, Rainforest Puppy, who's now engaged to uh, to Zob Kitten, and I think that's really cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So I want to talk about Bastille Linux. I'm having a uh, Serious VMware problems, so the uh, the attack and defense demo that I wanted to do is uh, is not going to work. Um, anybody who's really upset and wants to leave, you're quite welcome to do so. I'll turn around so I don't see who leaves. Okay, whatever. So anyway, I was able to I was able to craft a uh, I was able to craft a talk pretty darn quickly, and we'll go with this. And then uh, what I want to do is try to encourage Q and A, like you know. It's not because I don't have material, but, but because I did Q&A last year here, and we were Bastille Linux was at a different stage last year, and, uh, we're to, and, and so like Q&A would be really fun this year, because like we got, we got a room really going. Um, a few people are arguing back and forth about what should be done and what shouldn't be done, and that's kind of cool. So for now, what I want to do is talk about where Bastille's been, um, you know, how it's, what we do, what the design is, um, where we are now, it's kind of fresh and new, um, or actually rather fresh and new, and where we're going, because um, uh, I'm kind of excited about it. So, okay, what's Bastille? Lots of, you know, they're, they're, I don't know, how many people use, have used Bastille or have heard of Bastille? Okay, cool. So, the rest of you, this is what it does. Um, Bastille is a, uh, is a hardening script for Linux and Unix. Okay, to put it really simply, we make it a lot harder for people to root your box, or actually for people to just get any kind of unauthorized access on your machine. It's not magic. This is not a kernel hack. This is not a new operating system. All we're doing is basically running a script, or we're, we're, running, we're running through a program that can help you set much better, much better configurations than the defaults your vendor ships. And we'll take some time during this talk to blast vendors, even though I work for one. Um, uh, but you know, yeah, we're trying to we're trying to make it a whole lot harder to for someone to nail your box because if I stuck a Red Hat 6.0 box out right now and told you guys it was on the wireless net, if a bunch of you could like you know you could all we could all go ad hoc and you could take it down, each of you could root it and root it again and root it again and just like oh damn that sucks. Um, on the other hand, if we stuck up a system that like somebody taking some real time to harden, um, y'all wouldn't be getting too far. I mean, maybe one or two of you, I don't know if RFP is still here, maybe he'd have some, he'd have some fun if we stuck a web server up, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been pretty effective. Um, and without any kind of hardening, without any kind of good configuration, most of us are pretty screwed. Um, okay, so we run on Red Hat 7, 7 excuse me, and 7.1, Mandrake 8. Um, we're going to run on a bunch of others. HPUX is the next target. Um, we're going to have that. I'm not sure when. We're going to have it soon, though. Um, and Solaris, I think, is coming after that. I don't know. There are good, there, there are good solutions for Solaris, but I'm not sure that any of them get quite the right approach for everybody, especially for newbies. So, uh, you know, we're going to get in there. Okay, so what does Best Deal do? I gave you the overview. Here's, here's some of the more general stuff. Um, we set up a firewall for you. No, this is not the you know amazing, amazing firewall, but actually it's it's pretty darn it's pretty darn robust. So our firewall is basically it's set up for IP tables or IP chains. If you start up with us with IP chains, you can use your conf you can use your policy and it'll move it over to IP tables just fine when you upgrade. Um, that's not good. Okay, so we'll set up we'll set up a uh, we set up a firewall for you. Firewall for either a single box or like a bunch of networks, um, and you get to, you can classify what kinds of networks each one is, and it'll do masquerading for you and all kinds of cool shit like that. Um, I like the firewalling option, even if you don't have a whole network beyond this machine, I love to put a personal firewall on each box. Um, it, it's, it's a nice step. It means that a lot of the stuff you do, a lot of the, if, if you've tried to block people off from, from given servers, block them off with the server's configuration and also with the firewall too. It's kind of cool. Um, we also do a set UID audit. I don't know, you all know what a set UID is? Who doesn't? Oh, 
Cool. Okay. So we do a set UAD audit. This is basically we're just trying to find stuff that's got privilege and either like take the privilege away or make it less accessible to users or to programs or whatever. We're trying to stop people from we're trying to stop people from either getting on the box or escalating privilege when they are on the box. What else do we do? Turn off unnecessary shit. Okay? If uh, if you're not using your web server, we'd sure as heck like to turn it off. Red Hat feels differently about this. They think that they should just leave it on because you might get around to using it later. Um, but uh, I don't know. For everybody who had uh, their their DNS server on, well, on a bunch of different releases, but anybody who like you know who never turned off the DNS server and it got installed, it got installed and was left on, and you never used it, but you know it got rooted anyway. <laughs> That's no fun. Um, we try to deactivate as much as we can, and whatever we can't deactivate, we try to tighten. Um, we try to set better configurations, better defaults, and just make it a whole lot harder to uh, to to uh, to get access to the stuff that's to the remaining stuff that's there. Um, I guess the last thing that we do, and this is something that a lot of people have tended to like, is we educate. And this is basically because when we were creating Bastille, we wanted to say, okay, let's just go through and harden a system and be done with it. And we realized that users would get really pissed off because we'd shut down their telnet. You know, we'd shut down their telnet daemon. Like, wait a second, they used to be able to telnet into this, and now I can't. So we're like, okay, well, we'll ask them, hey, do you mind if we turn off telnet? And so we thought, yeah, let's do that. Except the problem is that most people don't know, you know, most, most average users don't know that telnet sucks, that telnet's really bad. And if they don't know that telnet's bad, they don't really know to turn it off. So then we're like, okay, fuck, um, we're educational now. Um, so we started including we started including a whole lot of a whole lot of you know stuff that says, hey, Telnet's bad because it's clear text and I can rip off your password. You know, I can watch Telnetting and I can steal your password. <coughs> Pardon me. We also said um, we also said, hey, you know, you know, Telnet's bad because I can use something like Hunt um, to uh, take over your session. Has anybody used Hunt? Who's used Hunt? One, two, three. I love DEF CON. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so you know, Hunt can be used to take over any session, um, uh, Telnet or any clear text session. Like you can use it for pop and stuff. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah, we found that education was really, really effective because users and even a lot of sysadmins tend to shoot themselves in the foot at every opportunity. Okay, so some people outside of DEF CON conferences claim that they don't need to harden their box. Say, listen, I installed it, it took an hour, I leave it alone, and I'll come back when it's rooted. I mean, I'll come back when it needs to be maintained. Okay, well, you need it because uh, vendors are not optimizing for security. It is not because they are stupid. Well, wait, I work for Mandrake, so Red Hat might be stupid, but um, Mandrake's not. <laughs> no. Smart enough to hire me. Okay, well, the thing is that Distributions and OS vendors are not shipping are not shipping secure by default anywhere close to it because it's not what their users want. The bulk of their users are looking for ease of use. They get really, really happy when an operating system is easier to use. You know, if the web server is already turned on, the user doesn't have to figure out how to turn it on. That's good. For security, that sucks. Um, but you know, the people are people right now are paying for ease of use, not for security. So until that changes, we're going to need like third-party stuff to do the job. Okay. So the ship defaults stink because users want ease of use, and also because well, the programmers who make this stuff they want lots of functions, they want lots of functionality, they want lots of convenience, and that often also runs counter to security. If you talk to some of the programmers of uh, of some of the stuff that turns up vulnerable, it's kind of diff, it's kind of weird because they've got a completely different mindset. I mean, they just the reason they got into programming was to make their system, you know, easier and more convenient and shit. And so, you know, it's interesting because I've talked to a number of programmers who work for OS vendors or whatever who are really ticked off that we don't have like, uh, you know, we don't just set all root passwords to null and be done with it, you know. Sorry about that. Sure. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I'll try to speak up as much as I can throughout this. Just remind me if I don't. Okay. So, yeah. Users need it as ease of use. Programmers want convenience and functionality. And neither one of them tends to grok security in general. In general. Don't, don't tomato me, guys. Okay. So, why do you need security? 
um, very quickly. Uh, sometimes you're targeted by like really good guys, okay? RFP rooted my box once. Well, no, he didn't. But um, if he had, he might have done it because he was going after some bank and he wanted to make it look like I was going after the bank because then, like, you know, I'd get in trouble. Um, you're also you're also targeted by script kitties. Uh, you're also targeted by other hackers called script kitties, and I've met a couple of them here and there. Nobody here though. Um, and you get targeted by them, and that's, who mo that, that's what most of us are dealing with. We're getting targeted by script kitties because some script kitty found an exploit against whatever, RPC stat D, and they've got a scanner that goes and looks for people with that exploit, and then they go and sc scan like, oh, I don't know, the entirety of at home. Um, I didn't watch that happen. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, I mean, you gotta, a lot of us, a lot of us forget. We kind of, we kind of say, ah, I don't need to worry about getting hacked because I'm not interesting. And the thing is, you are interesting. You are interesting because you have an IP address. You put your box on the internet 20 minutes ago, and they found you. You got picked up by a scanner, and now they come in for you. So what is Bastille doing in, in general, in theory? We're trying to, damn, if those screens fall, I'm running. Um, what's that? Yeah, I'm, I'm safest here. OK. Um, it works by minimizing points of entry in general. Okay, we try to shut down network demons. For the network demons that you want to leave up, we try to restrict who can use them. Like a lot of these things, especially like web servers will do it. You know, you can say exactly what IP addresses, what interfaces they're allowed to, con to allow accept connections on. This can be amazingly useful. Lots of people don't need a web server. They just want a web server on their one machine because they're like writing up web pages or CGI scripts and they want to test them before they push them out to the main server. So if you're one of those people, what we'll do is we'll say, okay, we'll set your Apache to only accept connections from your box, which, which works pretty well. As far as points of entry, we also, try to, we also try to restrict access to used or accessible programs, okay? We try to do things like, um, like my users are, are logging in like across an ocean, so maybe they don't need to be able to mount the floppy drive, which means I can like shut down mount, I can take mount and make it non-set UID, and that'd be good, because then I'd avoid one of the exploits in the past year or two. Okay, um, we're also trying to prevent privilege escalation. Okay, what happens sometimes is somebody hacks the web server. The web server gives them user whatever, user web. And then from there they run some set UID program that gives them user root. So um, we want to do anything we can to stop somebody from turning user web into user root. Because, you know, it's a good idea. You all having fun? Is this good? Yeah. Cool. Make some noise! No, I'm sorry. I have. <laughs> okay, so um, now does it work? It does work. It does work. It's kind of cool, but it actually, I mean, I, I didn't know it was going to work, but it works. I mean, you know, if you, it, if you take Red Hat 6.0, okay, and you take the vulnerabilities that existed in Red Hat 6, we really helped you dodge or at least contain the bulk of the exploits. And that was pretty cool. Okay, there was a remote root hole in bind. Okay, we let you shut down bind, which again would kind of help you dodge that entirely. And if you didn't want to do that, bind used to ship, used to ship default, so still does in some distros, used to ship default running as root. And that kind of sucks because somebody takes over bind, some worm takes over bind. You don't even get automated by a human. You get automated by some stupid program. Okay, so what we can, what, what we do is, you know, we set bind to run as user DNS, and we cheroot it, which means we lock it into some itty bitty directory, where like, you know, if somebody takes over bind, if somebody gets a, a, a DNS shell, that shell is restricted to this itty bitty directory that's got virtually nothing in it, and nothing really, nothing really that bind owns that that user owns except for one little itty bitty teensy weensy PID file. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. We helped a lot of people dodge that, and that was like the scourge of Red Hat 6. I mean, a scourge of a lot of other stuff, too. Um, Woo FTPD had an exploit. It's always got an exploit. I guess it's like bind. Um, we offered to shut it down for you. We also offered to shut down anonymous access or user access or both. And that was really useful because um, the ad exploit kind of requires that they actually be able to, my own, yeah, the, the first exploit at least required that somebody be able to write stuff to your machine. Um, and uh, we try to shut down any kind of access we can. Um, again, this is where the educational aspect came in more than, more than the script aspect. If we could tell you that FTP sucks, 
You know, FTP sucks because it's clear text. FTP sucks because it's really rough to firewall. FTP sucks because they're always rooting it. You know, if we can tell you that FTP sucks, maybe you'll stop running it, and then you don't have to worry about getting nailed by this one. Um, User Helper was a little known PAM program, and there were a couple different exploits against it. Um, I think Dildog wrote User Rooter. Um, and then there was another one, I don't remember what the name of the other exploit was, but it was really simple to exploit because this thing didn't check what directory, what directory it was looking in, so like you could have it go back and use some other, use some other file. It was, it was a pretty cool exploit. Um, it was local only, um, but basically the user could get this root program when doing, I think it was when doing authentication or doing, it, to go back and use some library that he created instead of the normal library. It was really stupid, um, and again, we helped you dodge it because when we did our set UID audit, that was just one of the things that like, this doesn't, we don't need this. So um, this, was, this was useful. LPD and SendMail had a remote route. We shot these down if you asked us to because lots of people don't print from that machine or lots of people don't need to send mail from that machine um, or to receive mail. Um, there were some more. Dump and restore. Dump and restore was kind of stupid. I mean, uh, it, really, it really ticked me off when I saw Dump and Restore set UID. Because let's think about it. Dump and Restore are used for backups, OK? So do I have ordinary users who are running their mail accounts running my backups? Uh, if I've got someone running my backups, it should be somebody that I've specifically told the operating system to trust. And uh, this is one of those stupid things that just shouldn't have been set UID. Um, and well, uh, we took care of that. So again, you didn't get rooted by by the dump exploit or the restore exploit if you, uh, if you did our set UAD audit and like did what we told you to do, which was kind of cool. Um, GPM was another one. That's, uh, they use that for, uh, to, uh, to get the mouse cut and paste in console. Um, lots of people never use console. So again, it was something we could shut down. And if you shut it down, you dodged yet another exploit. Now that one was a local exploit, and there are lots of other ways to locally root a box. So you know the, the, the merit of this was only so strong. But it was pretty useful. Yo, question. So the question is, what if they do want to send and receive mail? OK, you know, what do you do? Well, the issue is some of this can be granularly configured. OK, you know, it's like, suppose you've got this machine. I mean, if you're like lots and lots of users are using SMTP to get mail off the box. And they're using pop and IMAP and pop and IMAP to get mail to their box. Like, if this if this workstation you're sitting in front of doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to receive mail and distribute it to users, then you don't need send mail running um, in daemon mode. You can just like shut it down, and uh, you know when you run like mutt and pine and all that, they start up their own send mail process to get mail off the box. You really only need send mail to get mail to the box, and that's only if you're using if you if you're trying to run your own mail server. Um, it turns out that the bulk of the people don't need it, and so we're able to shut down just what they don't need. You know, it's like, okay, your mail still works, just this part doesn't work. Um, the, other, the other issue is, I mean, the, a better example is probably Apache. When we go to harden Apache, like, a lot of people want to have a web server, but they're not ever going to use, they're not, they're not going to put any CGI scripts on. So we shut down CGI functionality. We shut down server-side, in, server-side includes, and that kind of, the granular parts really do help a lot, and sometimes it's just the education part helps. Um, where we can't config, if we can't configure something really, really finely, um, we can educate you on it, and we can pray, or or hope, or whatever, um, <laughs> because we're not doing anything in kernel space. And if you really want to, if you really wanted to, um, if you really wanted to to protect yourself from from Sandmail's next root hole. It mostly ends up doing. It mostly means doing something in kernel space or rooting send mail or something like that. So, um, eh, was that a good answer, or did I mostly dodge the question? The asker has passed out from heat exhaustion. No, he hasn't. <laughs> it's all good. Okay, uh, vulnerabilities we didn't stop in Red Hat six. These are just like major. This just like stuff that was like well advertised. NMH. Mailer, um, ah, couldn't do anything for you. It didn't have privilege. It only gets privilege if you run it as root. If you're not running it as root, um, then uh, um, you don't get nailed. But if root's reading their mail uh, with MH, or in this case, if root's using man to read man pages, um, 
you kind of get nailed. And we didn't, we didn't really spot that stuff because it, it's not a program that had privilege that we could strip pri privilege from. And it's not stuff we could make a good argument for, like, removing from the system. So, I mean, especially man, you know? Like, we want people to read man pages, not, you know, not to stop. So, uh, you got, you possibly got nailed on these. These are pretty tough to exploit, so you probably didn't. But there's, there's not much we can do. The one point I can make about, about uh, root is try to just use root for what you need root to do. You know, I mean, please don't run Netscape as root. Um, oh, God, please don't. Um... Um, you know, I don't know. Now that now that she's married to uh, now that she's getting married to 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 a RFP, maybe maybe Zob Kitten will take some time and and try to show why we shouldn't use Netscape as root and make a whole bunch of exploits that that people get nailed at reading their mail. Sorry. Okay. How many minutes did you just miss? Shit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I sound really loud to myself up here. I got big speakers or something. Um, you want me to go back two slides? No. Okay, I'm going to keep going, but I'll just try to keep this next to my mouth. Okay, so um, Bastille. Um, people are using it. Um, SGI has been shipping it on a bunch of their appliances, which has been pretty cool. Their Linux appliances, not their IRIX ones. I don't think they have any IRIX appliances. Um, Mandrake Soft, kind enough to hire me. Go Mandrake Soft, woot woot. Um, is shipping it in their distro which is really cool. So it's not, it doesn't run at install time because Bestial takes a while to run and asks a lot of questions and they figure users would get annoyed by that and that's cool, but it's in there. So if, you're, if, you've, got, um, if you've got a Mandrake 8 or later, you just type interactive Bestial and, and boom, you're running it. You, know, you've got, you don't have to download it. You don't have to put up with like my RPM distribution method or whatever the hell. Um, HP has also developed three programmers and, and I think a manager as well to like well, the manager, I think, is supposed to hold the programmers. No, I'm not going to say that. Um, I'm just kidding, especially if the HP guy's in the room. Now, HP's devoted some programmers to help out with porting it, so that like really rocks. I'm I'm really happy with that because we're going to work on HPUX, and we weren't going to do that for a while, and they're helping out. Um, HP's doing some cool stuff in open source right now, so I'm happy with that. Um, we think we've got a lot of users. We really don't know how many. The problem with finding out how many is we've got one central site and like everybody, like everybody pulls the files down and distributes them elsewhere. So we got, it's going out through packet storm and it's going out because, you know, kitties need, uh, kitties need secure systems too. And um, it's going out through a bunch of different security sites. So we're not sure how many people we've got. We know the main site has seen um, some huge number of downloads. I think we saw like 50,000 to the main site at least. I mean, we're at 100,000, but the tough thing is we don't know how many people got each version. So it's kind, of, it's kind of crazy. But a lot of people are using this, which is really good. So hopefully a lot more people will be, will be using it when it runs on HPUX and Solaris and Debian and Slack. And we'll see what comes next after that. And, and some guy, like, actually made it work on SUSE, but uh, he hasn't given me any of his materials yet. But we can razz him later. Yeah. Okay. So Bastille will work on SUSE. Read the Linux Journal article on it, and like you know, it'll help. I don't know. Red Hat. Anybody from Red Hat here? Okay. Yeah. Anybody got a T-shirt? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so hopefully, maybe Red Hat will like will start using Bastille or their own hardening script or whatever the hell, and we'll get we'll get better defaults out of Red Hat. Do we work on Wirex? We work on Wirex. The Immunix, Immunix, Wirex's Immunix distribution is very close to Red Hat, so it like uh, Greg um, sent us like three line a three line patch that made it work on Wirex and Wirex is Immunix. So yeah, we work there. I dig Immunix. As somebody who works for a vendor, I probably shouldn't say anything more. Like I really dig Immunix, but it's pretty cool. They they do kernel stuff. We do configuration stuff. Combine the two, it's pretty cool. Um. History. Bastille started out like originally they were going to write they were going to make a distribution from scratch, hence the Bastille Linux name like Red Hat Linux, Mandrake Linux. So they were going to make a distribution from scratch, but um, that was a whole lot of work. I mean a whole lot of work, and they just couldn't keep up, and it was pretty discouraging, and it stunk. So they said, let's just make a script that turns Red Hat Six into a decent operating system. I mean, into a more secure operating system. I'm having fun here. I don't get to say this stuff at any other conference. Um, 
So basically they said, okay, we'll write a hardening script. Anybody got a hardening script? And I kind of came on and said, I, I, I can write one. Um, so they let me, which is cool. So now we've, we've, been, like, we've been adding stuff. We're going to add some really cool stuff. I'll talk about that later. Um, but it was, a really, it was a really simple, really very, very simple, not so intelligent hardening script that turned a fresh Red Hat 6 install into something a whole lot better. Okay, fresh. I just installed Red Hat. 1.1, um, Jay sat down for like, you know, a few weeks and coded up a new API and did a whole bunch of work. And now, at that point, it started working on non-virgin systems. Okay, so, you know, you install Red Hat 6, you sit alone for six months. Um, hopefully, you left it unplugged so it doesn't get rooted. Um, and then you run uh, Bastille on it and you get something a whole lot better. Um, we also added a bunch of stuff. Like, it's a whole lot easier for people to extend it. Like, you all can write modules. And I've got some slides that are going to be on my site in the next week that will tell you how to write your own modules if you want to. And then you can send them to me and we'll include them in Bastille. Um, it's very extensible. We put a cool configurator on it. It's got a whole lot smarter. It's got all kinds of cool features like an undo. And it keeps track of everything it's doing. And it'll tell you what it's doing and, and all kinds of cool stuff like that. 1.2, we just released. Uh-oh, this is a past slide. Um, 1.2 we just released um, a, a few weeks ago. and. Um, it's pretty cool because it's smart. It's it's smarter. It will like look at the state of your system a little bit and not do stuff that it's really obvious. It doesn't not ask you questions. It's really obvious. Don't apply to you, um, and that's going to get even smarter. Um, and we got an X configurator that I'll show you when the when we're done with the slides. Okay, we're growing too. Um, we're going to add more modules, more content. We got a bunch of people who want to help with that. Um, at some point, we'll get decent documentation. But right now, the script is its own documentation. It does pretty well that way. Um, we're going to run on more platforms. I told you we're going after HPUX with, like, you know, with a, uh, with a quick pace. And then uh, Solaris is next. Anybody here from Sun? We're coming for you, you bastards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about FreeBSD? Oh, boy. Um, FreeBSD's actually got some interesting work going on as far as security. Um, so I've kind of thought of them as, as uh, not quite the, the best next target. Because FreeBSD, in my mind, is a whole lot better off. I mean, in my mind, for a lot of reasons, you're a lot better off running FreeBSD, running, Solaris than Free, I mean, running FreeBSD than Solaris. And I want to kind of make Solaris a whole lot better. So I'm, I'm going up to Solaris right now. But once the Solaris and HPUX is done, it's going to be a whole lot easier to look at FreeBSD. In the meantime, I'm not sure if somebody's, if somebody's got solutions. There's been some people trying to work on that for like two years. I'm not sure where they're going. I didn't really want to step in their space before taking some real time to, to see what shapes up. Yeah. IRIX. Um, IRIX, we, are, uh, we had a university offer to help us to, to donate a grad student to, to port to IRIX. And, uh, and they've kinda, they kind of got, they kind of backed off. I think they lost their grad student or something. Um, but we've thought about IRIX, and if somebody stepped up to the plate to help out with IRIX, I would, I would definitely look at porting to there. Uh, yeah, another question over there. Who's, I'm sorry? The, the, yeah, I know. Center for Internet Security has a Solaris hardening script, as well as a checker. Yeah, they do. Um, the... The, ch the, ch the, the, the hardening script is really kind of like beta. Maybe it's alpha. Um, as far as Center for Internet Security, what it's doing is like, it's doing a sub, it, they're, they're kind of checking a subset of what Bastille does and what I think a, a really good hardening script should do. They're trying to look for minimum standards. Um, so they've also got a very, very basic script that Hal Pomerantz wrote. Um, and it will try to bring you up to compliance with their, with their standards. I think that Bastille does a whole lot better job. Um, and honestly, uh, I'm involved with the Center for Internet Security. I, uh, I wrote the tester. Um, so I think there's some, there's some possibility we're going to end up using Bastille, um, that we're going to see if we, can, if we can distribute Bastille or make Bastille do the center stuff. I'm not sure. I have no idea where that's going. So that, that quote is vaporware. Um, but yeah, so Center for Net Security's got stuff. A bunch of people have stuff for Sun. Okay, there's Titan for Sun. There's Yasp for Sun. There's Jasp for Sun. Okay, each of them has re some really strong points and some really weak points. Um, I think that uh, they can use some competition. 
I think honestly that I'm not really going to try to push you all to go to Bastille for Solaris. I mean, use one of the things that have been around for a while. There are established standards. Feel free to use them. However, if you have a heterogeneous shop where you're running Bastille and you're running HP and you're running Solaris, I mean, if you're running, I'm sorry, if you're running Linux and you're running HP and you're running and you're running Solaris, maybe writing one policy config file and pushing it out to all three might be kind of cool, you know, without having to figure out for each system. So there's some use in Bastille being on Sun, and there's some reasons to use something else. Um, and I'd be happy to explore that in Q&A later on. Can somebody tell me what time it is? My clock has stopped. 12.40. What's that? OK. So I wanted to, I can either run through each, all the features of Bastille, what, what we do, or I can show you, you know, I can show you one of the screen and screens and take Q&A. Who wants uh, you know, all the slides that tell you about what Bastille does? Q&A and, Q and, and a slight demo? OK. There are a lot more people in this room. Um, Jay, get off the stage. Jay, OK. Cool, cool. I'm happy with that. What do the rest of you want, man? Air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. OK, I'm taking that vote again. Damn it. <laughs> Who wants to see what Bestial does? Bunch of slides. OK, we'll, we'll go through and say, this is something Bestial does. Here's why it does it. OK. Who wants to see a demo and do Q&A? OK, we're doing a demo and Q&A. Thank you, guys. What? Damn, this conference rocks. I, I was running PowerPoint. Let's see. For those of you that saw Bastille before, it's got a little prettier. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can see my own screen because my laptop's not doing it. OK, so yeah, that's the interface. And what you see on the left side of the screen, over there, um, what you see on that side of the screen is a list of modules. Each of those has a certain number of questions and thus actions. So like um, the Apache module um, obviously uh, hardens your FTP server. No, the Apache module does the web server. You all are falling asleep on me. I know it. OK, so what you see is we've got a, on the right side, you've got a question and explanation. The question is the thing I wanted to ask you in the first place. The explanation is all that stuff I figured I had to tell you so that you could make an informed choice. Um, some people have thought that the explanations are really one of the better parts of Bastille. They're like, you know, I don't want to use a script to do all this stuff. I want to do it by hand. But I'd sure as heck like to, you know, like to learn something without having to read an entire book or whatever. So the explanations are, are really darn useful. Um, the nice thing about Bastille is that as you go through, it's not making changes until you end. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can read all the explanations and then quit out, you know? Um, okay, so let me pick a good example question. What's that? What are the defaults? So the question is, are the defaults all hardening steps? In other words, if you just click enter, 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 or whatever, or, or, or you know, next, 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 what happens? What happens is that you get the defaults that I figure will keep Jay from getting yelled at all the time. OK? So the defaults are not the most secure. They're not like do everything. Because if we do everything, we are going to piss, I don't know, 40%, 50% of the people off. Maybe everybody, OK? So the idea is that we want to, we tried to set defaults. We didn't want to set defaults. We wanted to make you actually read each question and decide what was best for your system, because then you get the best security. But living in, a, uh, living in an imperfect world, we said, OK, um, yeah, we'll make the defaults so that if you go through all the defaults, you probably won't bitch at Jay. Because I get a whole lot of email about Bastille as it is, and, and like answering the same question over and over about why Telnet's gone kind of sucks. 
Um, so no, the defaults are not all uh, make the box unusable. It's, it's, it's whatever I thought would not piss people off. So here's an example question. Um, it's not massively readable from the back, I'm sure. Um, it says, uh, question, would you like to disable set UID status for mount and you mount? Okay. So who doesn't know what set UID is? Oh, come on. Somebody in this room. Okay. Set UID. Um, what it does is lets an ordinary user get full super user privileges. They get the privileges of root just to run this one command. It's really, and an example here is that mounting and unmounting drives, everybody kind of figured that you'd only want like root to mount and unmount drives. Um, and so if you want to use mount and U-mount, like if you want to mount a floppy drive or CD-ROM drive, you might not be root. You might just be like some user on the system. Like I'm letting you play Quake or whatever on my system, and so you want to mount the Quake CD-ROM. Um, so the idea is that if, and, and what this question says is, mount and U-mount are used for mounting slash activating and unmounting, deactivating, drives that are not automatically mounted at boot time. This can include floppy and CD-ROM drives. Disabling set UID would still allow anyone with the root password to mount and unmount drives. Okay, so what you're saying is kind of like, yo, if this is a server that like no one's ever walking up to and sticking floppies in, or at least no one that you want to stick floppies in, then, um, then maybe you should turn off set UID. And if you did this, you dodged an exploit because there was an exploit in mount that gave somebody who had access to the box I mean, who had local access on the system, not physical, but local access on the system, they got root out of whatever user they had. So um, everyone all of a sudden starts to run home and find their uh, exploit for mount. Um, but yeah, the, you can find the exploit, I think it's on PacketStorm. Um, but so, uh, so we can, you know, we, we offer to shut this off. You can kind of choose yes. Question. Yeah, question. Good question, damn it. Um, so the question was, when you run this, does it check what the state of the system is and then let you change it? Or does it just look at the defaults? A little bit both. Um, what we do is we're not investigating the system to learn what the settings are right now. Okay? What we're doing is letting you create, in essence, we're letting you create a policy file. So we say, we've got our default policy, but if you load up a previous policy, you can edit that. So if you had a policy on your system, it brings up the current policy, which means if you ran Bastille once, you change your mind about something. Okay, you run Bastille, you change your mind, you go back and you change something, it does the right thing and it knows that you pre had the previous setting. But right now, we're not investigating systems. The reason that we're not going and investigating your system is that Linux Conf, Webmin, and a bunch of other things try to do this configuration management magic. Um, and I think they suck. Um, and a lot of people think they suck. And the more you learn about them, the more you think they suck. Um, so I don't, wanna, I don't want people to say Bastille sucks, um, except when they're just having fun or something. You know? I mean, I, I don't want people to say, yeah, config, you know, Bastille doesn't always work. The way we say Linux Conf doesn't always work. So I'm not going there right now. So right now, the idea is we, we help you set a policy. You create a policy file, and you can push that across a system or even a thousand systems. You can take that policy file and use it on a bunch of other systems that are similar enough. I'd be prepared to evacuate you guys. Okay, so, um, so, so that's what we're doing. Cool? Okay, so you go through and you answer questions. Do you guys want to see more of the questions? You just want to like... Okay. Um, question. Yep. Okay, so the question was, can we configure stuff on a per-interface basis? Can we say that Apache should only respond on ETH0 but not ETH1, or the other way around? Or set Apache to only run on local interface? Yes, we can do that for Apache. We can do it for the stuff we can do it for, and then we've got a firewall, individual machine firewall, that'll let you set which, which interfaces you know, the, the, the machine will take Apache-related traffic to, if you can define what that is. Yeah, question. Is the firewall, did we write new, new Linux kernel firewalling from scratch? No. <laughs> um, if you've got, 
Linux 2.2, 2.4 with the associated IP chains binary or IP tables binary, we will run through a whatever, 300, 400 line firewall and just run IP chains, IP chains, IP chains commands or IP tables or whatever. Yes? It overwrites what you have. The question was, does it overwrite your existing firewall? Yes. We, again, um, it's really, really hard for a program to be smart enough to parse your current firewall and then make, you know, and then make additions to it that make sense unless it understands the firewall. So it's, we're making our own, which gets you better security in general. Another question. Does it tell you what changes have been made or does it make the changes? Well, the first answer to that is as you're reading through, you kind of find out what you're doing. You know, we just, we just, took, uh, we just took set UID off ping. Um, but we also have a log file that tells you everything that it did. Um, if, you're, if you're a Perl programmer, it makes more sense. Um, but, you know, or if you're at least a system and it makes more sense, uh, newbies can maybe figure it out. So, um, yeah, we kind of, we're working on that. Mick. Wow, that's a lot easier. One of the reasons that I was able to get uh, Bastille to run on SUSE without very much effort at all was because of the rather high level of quality logging that Bastille does. And uh, so what, all that I had to do was go through that log after, after running the policy script and seeing what failed and why. And in most cases, it was just a matter of some config file not being where it would in, say, Red Hat or, or in Mandrake. And, you know, a lot of the differences between SUSE and, and those OSs kind of boils down to locations. And uh, then going through and tweaking the script itself. And I'm by no means a Perl guru, but there's enough, you know, English in Bastille Linux scripts to uh, customize them pretty equally. And I think that's one of the big strengths. So, you owe me a beer. I forgot about my beer. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, that was the answer. Um, there was another question? Yeah? <laughs> There's an explain less button. He wants an explain even more button. Yeah, what we did was we said, we're gonna, we wrote good explanations and we said, oh God, um, maybe some people want to get through this thing more quickly. So we made an explain less. So on a per question basis, you can define you can define how uh, you can define basically um, how good how detailed the explanations are, and that's a that's a really useful thing. Um, yeah, and explain even more. Okay, so yeah, plug time. Um, explain even more means read my articles on Security Portal or, or go buy my book when it's done or something. Um, the other version of explain more is. Um, the best thing you can do for security, one of the best freaking things you can do for security is to understand your system better. Okay, if you, if you understand, if the under, you can't really hack a system or you can't hack a system with your own script um, unless you really understand how it works. So the better you can understand your system, the better you'll get at security. There was a, yeah. I'm sorry. There's a very good suggestion. We should include a relative threat level. Say, this is something you can do. If you don't do it, you're a fucking goner, man. Or um, this is kind of just something we think might be useful. That would be a good idea. Um, it's with hardening. You're really just trying to you're just trying to get into a better state. But yeah, we can probably do that. Um, the tough thing is, what's the relative threat level of set UID mount? Until the mount exploit comes out, I don't know. That? Oh, yeah, if an exploit exists already, yeah, we can definitely do that. We can say, we've thought about actually doing whole space vulnerability. Like just saying, hey, as long as we're poking around your system, let us tell you what's wrong with it, you know? And that might be something we do. Yeah. Expanding on the explain more, expanding on the explain more um, maybe another thought would be to mention particular man pages that would be helpful for newbies as to which. Okay, what he said was, expanding on the explain more, maybe we should start referencing man pages that these newbies should read. Good idea. Yeah, question. Do we have a backup capability? Yeah, I'm right with you. We have a backup capability. Every time, whenever you, when you first run Bastille, 
Okay, when you first run Bastille, among other things, we make a backup of every single file we modify. Okay, they're in a directory called like var log Bastille undo backup. And in there, what you'll see is like your, your Etsy password file is in a, a directory called Etsy in there. So it's like you can actually use tar to go and undo the backup. Or you just run our fancy schmancy undo program. So yeah, we'll take you right back to where you were. Um, it's like a, it's not a really refined um, uh, go back, but it's like a big red button. Like I just ran Bastille and everything's all fucked up. So, you know, I hit a big red button and it all comes back. People use this thing a lot um, when, they, when they misconfigure their firewall. Yeah, another question. What are my feelings on sudo? Okay, sudo is used um, in place of, like, there are a couple things you can do with set UID programs or whatever. Um, you can take a set UID program and, and, and set it so it's not world executable, it's only executable by a group, and then put a bunch of people in that group. So you might have a group called uh, pingers, you know, people are allowed to use ping, as, uh, people are allowed to use ping as root. I like sudo. Sudo is cool. Okay, sudo lets you do the same kind of thing, except it's got a lot more flexibility and a lot more built-in security. Um, it's nice. Sudo is a nice option. I think everyone should go and read about sudo. Go read about sudo. Go check it out. It's really useful. If you are a system administrator in this room and you've got people helping you, you've got like, you know, little kids or whatever, like staff or something, um, you need sudo. Okay, it lets you delegate. It lets you delegate certain certain tasks to somebody without giving them the root password. So instead of my sysadmin, like you know, a, 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 a few years back, like giving me the root password on all the systems, <laughs> um, he could have like just given me like sudo permission to just do the stuff I needed to do. You know, like swap the tapes or something. Um, so sudo is really cool. I like sudo. all the backup files on the system. Does that open another local exploit? What about the security implications of keeping all those backup files, those undo files on the system? Does it open up another exploit? Eh, uh, you're too paranoid, boy. Um, not really, because to read that stuff, you've got to be root. Like, we set the permissions well. And if you're root already, you know, if, if you can read those files, you can, if you can read the backup, the old files, eh, uh, you can basically read the current ones. So, you know, we're not really... It's not really, um, you haven't won anything. Um, so it's, no, it shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, question back there. Ooh, I like this question. So both from the user community and developers who want to get involved, what can you do to help? Okay, so if you're a Perl programmer and you've got some part of the system that we're not currently hardening um, and you'd like to write a script, um, Samba would be really good. I'd love to see if somebody could do some good Samba, a good Samba like configurator for better security. Um, the best thing you can do is go and read the slides I'm going to put up on my website from a talk I gave last week in Bordeaux called um, Hacking Bastille Modules. Um, and that'll help you create, you know, your own modules. So, you know, Get in and like send me an email and say, I want to do this, and we'll start talking, and you can make your own module. If you're a user, there's lots of areas you can help. One of them is testing. We could really use some good testing. It's surprising you know, how, how, how hard it is to hold on to testers, but people get kind of bored. So um, yeah, we could use testers. Uh, people who have VMware are amazingly useful. Um, we can use people who can uh, write or clean up our documentation. Um, we can use people who can run Bastille on a system and then see what, and, you know, we can use hackers. We can use people who can run Bastille on a system and see what they can still do to it to send us an email and say, um, ha ha, I rooted the Bastille box, you know, like I'd, I'd, I'd find that very useful. I'd like some research. So um, whatever you can think of that you think you could donate to this product, project in terms of time, energy, and thoughts, um, yeah, you probably can. Uh, Future speaker, how many minutes do I have left? Oh, how many minutes do I have left? What time is it? 12.56, I got four minutes. When's your book coming out? When's my book coming out? Um, our, um, books take a long time to write and then a long time to publish and maybe a year, <laughs> maybe six months, but depends on how quickly I write. <laughs> yeah. With uh, 2.4 kernel, okay, with the 2.4 kernel in place of IP chains, we're having IP tables in place of IP chains. What does that bias? 
Um, much better firewalling, damn it. Um, among other things, um, FTP is a bitch to firewall when you've got a stateless packet filter. And it's a whole lot easier to firewall when you've got a stateful packet filter. Um, um, 2.4's packet filter is stateful. It's just a whole lot smarter, okay? Um, it's, just, it's just really good. And if there's no other questions, I'll go on and on about it. But stateful packet filtering rocks, and we take advantage of it, and we'll take advantage of more of the cool features like MAC address filtering or whatever. So, yeah, we'll get there. Um, there's some, it, it's, it's cool. I'm sorry? Uh, let, let's just say that you have uh, this configuration file and um, you have state configuration file, which is six months apart. How would you manage Look for differences? So the question was, uh, maybe we should do some file integrity checking. Like, we can look at today's configuration file and six months ago's configuration file and see what's changed. Um, yeah, it could be a cool idea. Um, we can install tripwire on the box, and that'd be, you know, or tripwire aid on the box, and that would be a really useful feature. Something to, something to, you know, tripwire is really good at detecting, uh, detecting a lot of hacks because um, it keeps track of a lot of important files and tells you when they change. And uh, yeah, maybe we should implement something like that. That'd be a good idea. Email me. Another, another question. So what do I think, uh, how do I think Bastille should be deployed? We talked about personal firewalls, and what does that do to administering the network itself? Well, my thought is, I don't trust nobody, okay? I, I don't trust my sysadmin, okay? I think my sysadmin is probably a really lazy guy. Actually, he's me, but, you know, in, in most examples, I don't trust my sysadmin or my network admin to get it right, to do the right things for me. So if I have the ability, I'll do anything I can to make it harder to nail my system. Um, that is to say, personal firewalls are really useful because whenever you've got a hole in the firewall, you've got a second firewall behind it, even if it's on the, if it, even if it's on the target box, that's a pretty useful thing. So I think as, as far as deployment, I mean, you can, as a sysadmin, you can roll it out across all your systems, or you can have individual users or box owners deploying it on their box. Whatever. It's all good. It's very, very useful everywhere. Um, you know? I don't know. Hey, another question. What time is it? Four. Hold on, last question. What's it? How do you it? feel about having a modularized kernel versus a monolithic? Oh, shit. <laughs> a kernel module question. Um, um, it'd be really cool to, to, to figure out exactly what you want on your kernel and build it and not have the capability to load modules. That would be really useful um, because then we don't have to worry about module like rootkit so much. But otherwise, uh, that's all I got to say. Okay, I am done. Remember to mention who's talking now. I'm sorry.